Do you guys hear me? I can hear you. Great. So, um, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for the uh, last seminar of the semester. Today we have Aaron Ross, is a professor at UPenn. Before UPenn, he was a postdoc at um, Microsoft Research, and prior to that, he received his PhD from CMU, and where um, Auburn Bloom was uh, his advisor. Aaron works on a variety of topics, algorithm, machine learning, game theory, and mechanism design. And uh, his focus is uh, on privacy and fairness aspects of ML. Uh, he received uh, several rewards, uh, including but not limited to presidential early career award for scientists and engineers, and also a Sloan Research Fellowship and NSF career award. Today, we're gonna uh, hear uh, about his work on differential privacy and machine learning, so I invite Aaron to start his talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's always nice to visit Boston, uh, even if not in person. Good to see familiar faces. Um, so so uh, yeah, people should feel free to interrupt the talk. This is probably, I don't have like that much to say. So this is probably more fun as a conversation. Um, I'm going to tell you sort of simple things today, not, nothing too technically complicated. Uh, what I sort of want to do today is, um, if you haven't seen it already, um, explain this problem of data deletion or, or machine unlearning um, you know, as a problem, um, and explain how, although the problem is different than differential privacy, um, techniques from differential privacy can be sort of uh, fruitfully and relatively directly brought to bear. And so I'll do this through sort of two anecdotes that are that come from papers with um, the, the collection of people on this slide. Um, so, so my student, um, Varun Gupta, um, Christopher Jung, uh, my former student, Seth, who is now uh, in your neck of the woods. He's a professor at HBS. Um, Saeed, who is uh, responsible for much of this, including many of the slides. And he's, by the way, on the job market. So if any of this sounds interesting, you should uh, hire him. And, uh, and Chris Waits, who is a very good student who will probably be applying for PhD programs next year. Uh, so you could look out for him. OK, let's see. To probably click on my slides to cause them to advance. Okay, so, so the underlying um, motivation, not, not, I don't want to draw some kind of like direct legal implication, but sort of the, you know, motivation for thinking about problems like data deletion comes from sort of this idea that people should have data autonomy in that, um, you know, if, if someone freely provides their data to a, a service provider, but then decides later that they no longer want the service provider to use their data, that it should be possible to ask them to, um, to delete their data. And this is formalized in um, you know, various ways in, in law. And again, I don't want to make, I don't want to claim any direct connection between what's written in law and sort of the technical definitions we're going to talk about. But, you know, a popular one that people talk about is, is GPDR's right to be forgotten that says that the data subject shall have the right to obtain from the controller the erasure of personal data uh, concerning him or her without undue delay. And, and there's similar language in um, California's CCPA. And so, you know, thinking about this problem Generally, when you know, if we should, if we're going to allow users to have their data be deleted, the question is, what should that mean? What, you know, what does it mean to delete someone's data? And um, you know, of, of course, removing their record from some SQL database is is pretty straightforward. But 
although that sort of deletes their data in some literal sense and, and maybe prevents it from being used to train new models, um, it does not remove the effect of their data, which lives on in you know, any, any derivative that was derived from the data, including machine learning models that were previously trained using the data. And um, <coughs> it's, so, so like in particular, the thing I wanna focus on is that deleting the data um, from the, you know, the SQL database that contains it does not remove its influence on downstream models. And, and we know through a, a sort of series of, of um, influential attack work in, in sort of uh, the machine learning security community that this can be quite disclosive. If you, if you sort of train models, um, at least without precautions, then it's possible to extract user data from them. It's possible to, uh, to launch sort of membership inference attacks and things like that. And so the actual goal is of, of data deletion is or should be not just to remove the data like you know, from the SQL data set, but to actually remove or, or at least limit the information about the data point that sort of lives on present in the system, including in any downstream derivatives like trained machine learning models. Okay. Maybe the one thing I wanna, um, one other sort of, you know, culture thing I wanna point out is that um, this has not, this idea has not like eluded regulators, right? So, so Here's um, sort of press release from the um, FTC from, from the beginning of this year. Uh, they, they settled with a company that they uh, you know, thought had been collecting user data without uh, their full consent for how it would be used. And what they ordered was that, you know, not just that this company delete the data they had collected, but they, that they delete the models that had been derived from the data. Okay, so there's this recognition that um, the effect of the data lives on in the models. Okay. So, um, okay. So, what, so, what does it mean to delete data from models? And we can talk about maybe the ideal solution. And and I, I sort of, you mean, know, thinking about how data deletion is going to be formalized in this talk and in some corners of the prior literature here. Maybe I want to um, draw some analogy to how differential privacy is motivated in that in both cases, what we're going to sort of think about is some ideal solution, right? And differential privacy, the, the sort of ideal solution from the perspective of Alice is that the analysis was run on some data set that just had Alice's data removed. Okay, well, here we're going to have some other ideal solution, um, right? If we want to make sure no information lives on, then when a data deletion request arrives, we should delete the data point from the data set, and then we should go on to, to recompute you know, re all downstream derivatives, all you know, retrain all models. Everything we did from the data from the very beginning, we should redo it now without, say, Alice's data in it if, if, if she asked that her data be deleted. And, and this is sort of like the ideal that we want to approach, but there's a problem with doing this naively, which is that especially if these deletion requests sort of arrive frequently, and if we have lots of downstream models or if they're very large, um, this can work, you know, fully retraining everything. Uh, every time a data deletion request comes in can re require enormous amounts of computation. It's just sort of not, not gonna be feasible, right? So, so big, um, big models that, that commercial, um, you know, machine learning service providers, um, use you know, are, are retrained relatively infrequently, a, you know, a couple of times a year. So you know, doing this regularly uh, just isn't feasible. And so the question is, can we um, do better than retraining, okay, in, in, in some aspects, maybe in, you know, in terms of computation time? And so, um, <coughs> you know, informally, the, this problem that has been studied in the literature over the last few years, which um, is probably better called data deletion, but uh, has, uh, you know, there's quite a few papers that call it machine unlearning now, because I guess that's, that's sort of a snappy name. Um, the problem is to design 
fast algorithms, fast deletion algorithms that are much faster, you know, computationally more efficient than, than retraining a model, uh, but produce output models that are the same or at least statistically indistinguishable from what would have resulted had you um, engaged in this sort of idealized full retraining solution. Okay, so, so at a high level, that's, that's the problem that we want to study. So let's, let's try to sort of formalize this a little bit um, with a picture. So <clears throat> here's the idea. Um, and, and we'll sort of have, you know, what's actually going to happen with, with uh, an unlearning algorithm on the left and, and on the right, we'll, we'll sort of write down sort of the idealized world. And, and in the end, the definition is going to be that um, the thing on the left should be sort of indistinguishable from the thing on the right. Okay. So when we talk about machine unlearning, there's really sort of like a, a pair of algorithms. There's going to be a, a, an algorithm A that initially trains a model. And then we'll have this algorithm RA, you know, an update algorithm or a deletion algorithm or an unlearning algorithm that takes as input updates and information from the model that was previously trained and produces, hopefully, you know, in some computationally efficient way, a new model. Okay, so at time zero training, we have our training algorithm. It takes as input some data set and it outputs something, some models. And it might pass some auxiliary information on to the unlearning algorithm, which at round one, when it receives its first deletion request, delete some point Z1, uh, outputs uh, you, you know, as a function of, you know, of the auxiliary information, which might contain the data set, for example, and maybe yesterday's model. Um, and of the deletion request produces a new model, theta hat one. Okay, and this is gonna happen sequentially. We're gonna think about a stream of deletion requests. And so there's gonna be T rounds and more generally at round T, we take as input all of the information that's been passed to us from you know, the, the deletion algorithm at round T minus one together with a new deletion request and we output a new model. Okay, so this is something there's, you should, Think of a, and this is something that you know, foreshadowing a little bit, um, we're formalizing in our work that, that sort of wasn't formalized in this literature before that, that we should really think about the deletion requests as coming in a stream. And, and as the talk goes on, we'll think about details of that stream, like you know how and when it's chosen. Okay. So on the other hand, we've got sort of, you know, the, the information theoretic ideal, the sort of thing that, um, you know, if, if computation was no object, you'd want to do, which is full retraining in every round. Okay, so it would begin in exactly the same way. You'd take the training algorithm A, you'd take the data set, and you'd train and you'd get some model, um, you know, theta hat prime of zero. But then when the first deletion request came in, you, you wouldn't uh, you know, run this, this update algorithm RA, you would just take your training algorithm again uh, and you would run it on what was the remaining data set. Okay, so, so D with, uh, with um, data point C1 removed and you'd get your model. And more generally at round T, <coughs> you would run your algorithm on data set, the original training algorithm, the same algorithm being run every time on data set D um, with all of the with all of the data points that have been requested to be removed, removed, and you'd get some model. Um, by the way, here, sort of for simplicity, I'm sort of imagining that all of the updates are deletions, but everything I'm going to say works just as well if the updates can also be additions. Okay, so, so you can think about, if you like, um, updates being things like add a point or remove a point. And so it makes sense to think about these streams as being like arbitrarily long. You don't have to think about them as being limited by the size of the data set, for example. Okay, so, so there's sort of the thing that's like the thing that we're actually doing on the left and like this idealized world on the right. And uh, what do we want? Well, sort of a notion of exact unlearning might be that you know, if I look at the model that's output at round T on the left, it should be the same as the model that's output on round T on the right. Meaning like functionally, we are like exactly recovering the right, just using, you know, a different implementation on the left. 
And if our training algorithms are randomized as they generally are, you know, like if we're using stochastic gradient descent, then it doesn't really make sense to ask that the model be, be sort of literally the same, right? Because there's randomness. So what you would do is you would ask that the um, distribution over model set round t produced on the left be exactly the same as the distribution over model set round t produced on the right. Okay, so this would sort of be this would if you could guess this would be sort of saying, look, you know, functionally we're implementing the sort of idealized um, full retraining scheme on the right. We're just we're just implementing it in some more computationally efficient way on the left, but the output is indistinguishable. And you know, oftentimes you can't um, get interesting or you know people haven't yet gotten very interesting results under this sort of exact model of data deletion. But you can ask for an approximate um, version of data deletion sort of in the spirit of differential privacy. OK, so this was a proposal that was first made by a, a very nice paper of Gennart et al. Um, a few years ago now. And it, it's sort of the, the relaxation of this exact unlearning guarantee that the distribution on models induced by the deletion algorithm should be the same as the distribution on models induced by sort of idealized retraining, um, where we replace exactly the same distribution with alpha beta closeness in the sense of differential privacy. Okay, so we can say that um, you know a particular a particular update scheme is an alpha beta unlearning algorithm for some training algorithm. If for every data set and for every sequence of deletions that might arise, or you know we, you can have this be sequences of deletions or additions, what we want is that the distribution on models that results from um, you know, th th that results on the left, right, at every time step t. So, th so the way we get a model on the left is we run the training algorithm and then we sequentially run the update algorithm on each of the points to be deleted. That this distribution on models should be alpha beta close to the distribution on models we would have gotten from running the algorithm on the right, which just repeats the full retraining on the data set that sort of we should have in our hands at day t after all of these update sequences. Okay. So yeah. right, just to ask a question, Aaron, or do you want to? Uh, yes. Yeah, to yeah no, go ahead. So I, yeah. I just had a question about the like asymmetry between mm -hmm. the original and the retrain, uh, the, the two worlds. Yeah, uh, that's right. So I guess, um, right, for differential privacy, like when you write down this thing, you know, it implies the the sort of reverse inequality as well because the neighboring relation is symmetric. Um, here, it's not symmetric. Um, so, so in in Ginnart et al, they actually only asked for this direction. In what we're going to do, because we're going to use techniques from differential privacy, we're generally going to get both directions. So, so we'll we'll get sort of the symmetric version of this. Um, so I, I don't I don't know if I have metric version. Say that again. Is there a reason to to prefer the asymmetric version? I mean, like, I, is there a kind of either a technical like it's easier to to achieve to attain or it makes more sense? Yes. Yeah, so, so you know, obviously the asymmetric version is weaker. So in that sense, there's no reason to prefer it. And I don't know of things you can do under the asymmetric version that you can't do under the symmetric version. You know, I guess if you wanted to motivate the, like if there was something you could do and you wanted to motivate the asymmetric version, you might say that, um, you know, the thing that we don't want to do is increase someone's confidence that we um, didn't do full retraining. We don't mind increasing their confidence that they did do full retraining, which is sort of what the what sort of the asymmetric version on the screen is asking for. But but I think um, you know I don't know it's hard for me to think about whether how satisfying that is. Um, so if you want for this talk, you can think of the symmetric version where we have sort of two inequalities, and and we also want that um, the probability of seeing something uh, 
from full retraining should not be too much larger than the probability of seeing something from deletion. Um, and, and you'll see like, like the way we're gonna get inequalities like this is, is you know, by doing stuff like adding Gaussian noise. So, so we will get the, the sort of two directional guarantee. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So you're using this definition, sort of N is to the the statistical indistinguishability, but it feels like you can actually have a very high different, like high total variation distance between the distribution of theta t and theta bar t, theta, sorry, prime t. Um, <laughs> Is that, am I understanding this correctly? Is it just an approximate well, version? Sorry, of sorry how, how do you mean? So, so, I mean, this is stronger than asking for something in total variation distance. So this should imply that the total variation distance is at most like alpha plus beta. Um, just as in, right, so, so, that, so, so just as in differential privacy, asking for alpha beta closeness is, is only stronger than asking for closeness in total variation distance. Oh. Does that answer your question? Oh, I, sorry, I, I didn't. Okay, so if you make alpha and beta small enough, then it also implies something <laughs> for a total variation distance. I was, yeah. I so, so think about these, alpha. just as in differential privacy, think about these as like kind of small numbers, like alpha, you know, less than one and, and beta very small. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay, good questions. Okay, and um, it, you know, as in differential privacy, when you when you set the problem up like this, uh, where there are different things you want, the, the the sort of interesting questions are sort of about trade offs. And here, the trade offs are sort of three way, as they are in differential privacy. Um, you know, we can ask for stronger unlearning guarantees by making alpha and beta small. We can ask for higher accuracy of our models, and we can ask for um, less computation. Uh, but so, sort of unlike in differential privacy, where sort of the I, so, sort of the idealized world is impossible to realize because the idealized world is different for each person training without their data. Here, sort of the information theoretically idealized world like is realizable. Like like, like we could retrain um, every round, which just means that part of this sort of trade-off landscape is already populated, right? Like you can always get optimal accuracy and unlearning guarantees at some computational cost, the cost of full retraining. And the interesting thing is to sort of populate other parts of the trade-off landscape. Okay. <laughs> and, and so I wanna um, note that, you know, there's some obvious similarities to differential privacy, but it's not exactly the same. Okay, so, so differential privacy uses the same metric for distributional closeness um, and has a similar philosophy where we're sort of saying, okay, well, on the one hand, there's some idealized world from the perspective of Alice's privacy. That's when we run the algorithm without Alice's data. And so if Alice is happy in that idealized world, well, maybe she should also be pretty happy if the observable outcome is almost indistinguishable from that, right? That's sort of the same philosophy of the definition here that if if we would have been happy with full retraining then you know we probably should be happy with a distribution that is hard to distinguish from that but what differential privacy is doing is it's comparing um, the distributions induced by the same algorithm run on different data sets on neighboring data sets whereas in some fear what we're asking for is to compare running different algorithms on the same data set, right? Like either the full retraining algorithm or the algorithm that sort of results from this sequence of unlearning operations and ask that those have similar distributions. Okay, so it's a slightly different thing. Uh, but like tools from differential privacy Aaron, are, okay. yes. Can I ask, like on this first point, if you, if you think of the algorithm as sort of, incorporating both the initial training and maybe deletion if a deletion request is received. Isn't it really the same algorithm on different input streams? 
Um, I, I guess if you wanted, you could think of it as, well, yeah, okay. So, so on the one hand, it's just running the training algorithm on the data set minus the points that have been deleted. On the other hand, it is running the training algorithm on the whole data set and then processing the output with, with the update algorithm on the sequence of deletion requests. Um, so it sort of a uh, seems like different algorithms to me. Like in particular, this update algorithm is like not present at all in, in, in this sort of idealized world. Um, uh, well, okay, fine. Yeah, I mean, if you just think of <laughs> like the ideal world is just one where the deletion requests aren't where the people never showed up, then. Seems yeah, if you, if you want, you could think about it like that. Um, in, in which case, right, it would be sort of the same algorithm on different data sets. Now, these data sets could, of course, differ in not just one person now. If, if everyone from the deletion sequence didn't show up, they could differ in lots of people. So, so you could think about it that way as well. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. But like, nevertheless, because of the, you know, because we're using the same metric for distributional closeness, um, tools from differential privacy will be, you know, like immediately useful here. So in particular, like noise will do the same thing it does in differential privacy. It'll convert distances and parameter space to distances in distribution. Uh, and differential privacy will serve to reduce dependencies that are introduced via adaptivity. And so let me like give very simple examples of this with, with sort of two vignettes. Okay, so the first one comes from a paper that we had in, in ALT um, about trying to get sort of simple data deletion requests for convex models. Okay, so we're gonna think about learning problems that have to do with minimizing convex loss functions. We've got data sets D that are n tuples of um, points from some, um, from some data domain. And the thing that we want to do is solve the empirical risk minimization problem over some parameter space, find the parameter theta that minimizes the average loss over these data points. And um, you know, uh, uh, the tool that we're you know, the, the optimization tool that we're going to use is gradient descent, um, which which you all know and love, and, and has a sort of simple update rule in terms of the gradient of the loss function at the, at the current parameter values. And the way that we will measure computation here um, is, is by just counting the number of gradient computations we need to do. And when we talk about accuracy, we're gonna talk about in-sample accuracy. Um, and that's because we don't wanna assume, you know, even if we assumed the data points were um, drawn IID from some distribution, we don't want to assume that the um, deletion requests are, are IID. And so, you know, <laughs> after it, it's unclear how to talk about out of sample um, error here, because after a long enough sequence of updates, the data set you have might bear little resemblance to the distribution from which it was drawn. So we're just going to punt on this problem and and talk about <laughs> in, <clears throat> in sample accuracy bounds. But since we're talking about, you know, convex models that satisfy, they're gonna satisfy nice smoothness conditions. Of course, if the points and the deletion requests were IID, you would straightforwardly have generalization bounds. Aaron. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, so um, you're right that you can't assume that the deletions are IID. I just want to comment that if you have people leaving because of sort of say political views, and so people with a given political view will all want to be leaving, then that might reflect the sample from which you could draw if you were redrawing. In other words, it might mean that in the population as a whole, people with that political view would refuse to, to join. And so you might be able to get some kind of connection to it and a new underlying distribution. Yeah, I think things like that are interesting. Um, so I don't wanna 
like I definitely don't want to say that thinking about in sample guarantees is like the right thing to do because of course like if our in you know, if our like what <laughs> what are we what are we even trying to do if our data set looks nothing like you know the population we want to predict on um I'm just saying we're sort of punting on this problem and there, there's likely interesting modeling work along the lines you're suggesting um you, you can also talk about of course um out of sample accuracy bounds uh you know like before you've had too many deletions yeah i think that's a good that's a good um comment though and i think maybe points to an interesting line of sort of conceptual work that hasn't been done in this literature yet okay so you can do some obvious stuff so, so let's let's think about some simple tricks for fast on learning in a, in a convex setting so you know the nice thing about gradient descent um and its convergence bounds in in convex models is you know the convergence bound depends on how far your starting point is from the point you're trying to converge to so you know initially when you're training you know you'll do some random initialization or something it might take you a little while to converge but after you've done that um you know you, you know something about where the optimal point is so when a deletion request comes in like maybe you shouldn't initialize randomly you should initialize uh at yesterday's model which hopefully isn't too far from from the model that will result after the deletion request okay so this is a natural thing to do um you know say this is is parameter space um data star of d is the optimizer on our data set of course initially we don't know what that is so we in our initial training you know start somewhere with all zeros initialization or a random initialization and we train for a while for some number of rounds until um we're guaranteed to get close enough say within a within a you know distance one over n of the um of, of the optimal um of the optimizer on our data set and since this is you know since we're sort of in a convex world you know there are convergence bounds that can tell us how long we need to train before we have a guarantee that we're within one over n of, of our optimizer and then a deletion request comes in so we've got like a new optimizer a new optimizer on the data set that um, results from removing this one data point point. and <clears throat> if our loss function was strongly convex um or if it wasn't initially but we regularized it so that it was now strongly convex then um then the yeah you know, since we've only changed one point in the data set the the location of the optimizer in parameter space also hasn't changed too much it's only changed on the order of, of sort of distance one over n so you know we we started from so if we start um our our learning or if we start our gradient descent um after this deletion request from yesterday's model which was within one over n of uh, yesterday's optimizer and today's optimizer is within one over n of yesterday's optimizer then we've started gradient descent close to where we want it to get. Um, okay, and you know the the fact that the optimizer doesn't move very much that requires strong convexity, um, but we can use the usual tricks if our if our loss function isn't strongly convex. We can add a strongly convex regularizer. Of course, there will be a trade-off to manage. The you know more aggressively we regularize, the more strongly convex it will be. But the sort of further the objective value at the regularized optimizer will be from the original objective value. But that's a trade-off we're used to dealing with. Um, now, of course, since we're only getting close to opt, we're not exactly reaching opt. We have to worry about path dependence, right? Like. Like just getting close to opt doesn't solve our problem because um, you know it's possible that we would always get to a different point in some small ball around opt if we if we started with you know retraining or if we if we got there through this sequence of deletions. Okay, here's another trick um, that you'll recognize uh, from the differential privacy literature as, as like subsample and aggregate, but is also studied in the distributed learning literature. Um, so I could have my data set and I could split it into uh, a bunch of parts, K parts. 
And I could train a model on each of these parts, okay, and get k different optimizers. And then I should aggregate them. Um, it turns out for convex models, like a really good way of aggregating them is just to average the parameters. And you can actually analyze this if the points in, in these different sets are drawn from the same distribution, then there are regimes in which um, training a bunch of disjoint models or, or you know, yeah, training a bunch of models on each of the partitions and aggregating them uh, by averaging them can get accuracy that is competitive with what you would have gotten training on the full set. So there's a literature on distributed learning that studies things like this. And the nice thing about this is that when a deletion request arrives, um, you know, like only one of the, the, the only one of the sort of partitions, and therefore only one of the models is affected. And so we can, you know, do this sort of accelerate, you know, do this gradient descent update, you know, beginning from yesterday's model, uh, except, uh, except in only one of these partition elements. And so um, this update, you know, since we have um, a factor of K fewer points used to train the model, um, works with a factor of K fewer gradient updates. And it says partition on this slide. In fact, for the convergence analysis, um, it's convenient to have these points you know, draw an IID from the same distribution. So it's sort of a little more convenient to sample the points with replacement so that, you know, they're in one partition in expectation. So there's some details you'd have to, um, you know, retrain all of the models that depended on this point, which isn't always exactly one. And, and you would need some reservoir sampling for additions and deletions to make sure that the distribution uh, on the partition data sets remains the same, but, but those are details. Okay, and so, <clears throat> okay, combining these two tricks, you know, you sort of have a framework for for unlearning in convex settings. Um, you've got your training phase. You run either regular gradient descent or this distributed variant until you get some epsilon convergence. You get within some epsilon ball of the optimizer up with the final model, and then when a deletion request comes in, uh, we just remove the deleted point from the data set, and we run either gradient descent in the centralized way or, or in this distributed way. Um, and on any affected model, we, we just initialize at the output of the previous round and run a number of updates until we're again guaranteed to get within some epsilon ball of the optimizer, but it's, it's fewer updates started close by. Now, this doesn't like yet have an unlearning guarantee, right? Because all we've guaranteed by getting within epsilon of the optimizer, whether we, you know, we're getting there in the initial training or through the unlearning phase, <coughs> is that, you know, the points are close in parameter space, right? Like if if training from scratch gets you to within epsilon of the optimizer and um, training from scratch and then updating using these, these iterative updates gets you within epsilon of the optimizer. All you know is that these two parameter vectors that you might've learned are within two epsilon of one another. Okay, but this is a problem that we solve all the time with tools from differential privacy, right? We just wanna convert closeness in parameter space to closeness in, in distribution. Um, and, and so we just add Gaussian noise. I see that there's a, something in the chat, but I can't see it. So if you have a question, please speak up. So um, the question says, uh, is that literature and distributed training uh, path and there is a link to archive uh, or something else? And the link uh, to the archive is a paper by uh, pa pa Paper Not a Buddy, uh, Erlingson, uh, Goodfellow and Talber and Semi-Supervised Knowledge Transfer for Deep Learning from Private Training Data. I don't know if it you probably uh, sounds it, like an interesting paper, but what I am thinking of is sort of literature from about a decade ago, just on sort of um, dis distributed, like analyzing the accuracy of this. The, the idea from this literature and, and the particular paper we we sort of used in ours is is by John Ducci and some other authors that I am embarrassingly forgetting at the moment. Um, but it's just analyzing the accuracy that you get when you 
independently train models on subsets of the data and then average the model parameters. So, so it's not it's not like it's not a differential it's not work in differential privacy. It's just work on distributed convex optimization. Okay, thank you. I think the person was looking for the reference, and I think yeah. So, so, so if you look at our alt paper, we cite this paper, but I am forgetting the title at the moment. Sure. Thank you. And and it's not just that one paper. Like th that's the results we use. But if you look, if you find that paper, you know, and follow the references forwards and backwards, there's like a whole literature on on distributed optimization. Okay. Um, so you add noise, and 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 so now um, you convert closeness in parameter space, which we got by running gradient descent for long enough to to closeness and in, in distribution, which is what we wanted. Okay. Um, and so let me just sort of give you an example of the kind of theorem you can get here. Here's sort of the, the kind of theorem you get from just sort of straightforwardly applying gradient descent without the, without the sort of distributed learning trick. Uh, when you apply the distributed learning trick, you get a more complicated theorem that improves on this one for sufficiently high dimensional data. But uh, let, let's just, you know, without worrying too much about like the, the numbers, just look at the form of the theorem. Okay so, okay, so first of all, we need to assume something about the loss function, that it's convex and smooth. And then this thing takes two things as input. Okay, it takes as input the targeted unlearning parameters, alpha and beta, and it also takes as input a computational budget, B, the number of iterations of gradient descent that we are willing to run um, for every deletion request. Okay, so remember, we're talking about trade-offs between the unlearning parameters, computation, and accuracy. So this theorem is taking as input the unlearning parameters and the computational budget. And then it's giving you sort of a, <coughs> a bound on the steady state accuracy, right? So, so by steady state, I mean, you know, there's the initial training, and then there's gonna be a whole sequence of deletion requests that come in. And each time we will be running our update algorithm, which will run B iterations of gradient descent. And like the accuracy of every model in that sequence will be bounded by this. Okay, the sequence can be as long as you want. Okay. And, and note in this theorem that like B can be quite small. But like, of course, as you as you increase B, you get more accuracy. But so long as N is bigger than square root of D, you can you can get interesting things even for just constant numbers of iterations. Okay. Here, Aaron, what's going on here is that like the reason there's no dependency on T is that is it the case that like you're just kind of maintaining an invariant that you never drift too far from the true optimizer and so like you can just kind of pr propagate that from round to round exactly and, and we give a name like in the paper we call these like strong unlearning algorithms because in the literature before ours like nobody ever like wrote down streams so the previous papers are written as, for a single deletion and and generally for these algorithms either the error or the deletion guarantees would get worse like if you, as a function of the number of deletions so we call such things weak unlearning algorithms and if if you get sort of a constant steady state error we call that a strong unlearning algorithm and, and yeah, you just have to like solve the equation so that you never drift too far okay, um, okay okay um one more anecdote um Right, so we, we're talking about a stream of deletion requests. Uh, so, you know, you can ask like, where does the stream come from? What does it look like? Okay, so, so let me give you a um, vignette from, from a, a paper that will appear in NeurIPS called Adaptive Machine Unlearning uh, with, with all the authors I had on my title slide. So the deletion requests arrive sequentially over time. And in principle, you might think that these deletion requests might be adaptive with respect to the output models, by which I mean, like, who asks that their data be deleted might relate to the models that you've published thus far. For example, people might choose to delete their data because they don't like what the models reveal about them, or they might just choose to delete their data if the models that you've published so far aren't like, 
especially useful for them. Like maybe they're happy to have their data used as long as they're using the service, but like are not happy otherwise. Right? In, in either of those cases, the deletion sequence depends on what you've published so far. And so in the, you know, we just talked about these sort of tricks for deletion in convex models. And one of them involved um, randomly partitioning the data and, and training different models. So it turns out that the deletion guarantee for that algorithm um, is actually only true if the uh, sequence of deletions is chosen independently of the output models, right? To, to like, like sort of, you know, we sort of noticed in trying to prove this theorem that we needed to assume that the deletion sequence uh, was, was independent of the models. And then we, you know, like, like so, so, you know, we, we sort of noticed this problem um, or this limitation of our theorem. And then once we noticed this, we sort of like looked back and realized that um, this was also like an implicit assumption in, in prior work in this literature. Again, implicit because prior work in this literature doesn't call out sequences of deletion requests. They just think about single deletion requests. Okay, but, but like sort of the most general prior work um, which applies to like non-convex models, which I'll talk about in a moment. Also, in order for it to actually have correct deletion, uh, correct um, uh, deletion guarantees or unlearning guarantees requires the assumption that the sequence of deletions is not adaptive to what's actually published. And so the question <laughs> is, can we design distributed unlearning algorithms that have guarantees against adaptive deletion sequences? Okay, so everyone here knows what differential privacy, and I imagine you're all familiar that you know differential privacy is some is a tool that can help us um, break the dependence between the input of an algorithm and the output of the algorithm. Okay, so so differential privacy, the definition we all know and love. Um, what we are going to do is again something pretty simple, sort of you know arbitrage across fields. We're just going to make use of these known connections between differential privacy and adaptive data analysis to help us here. Uh, and I, I'm teaching an algorithms course now uh, to undergrads. So, so here's a, a picture of an algorithm. If you haven't seen one before, uh, you know, it takes us into <laughs> the data set and it, it outputs something. Okay. So differential privacy and adaptive data analysis, um, you know, maybe like a, a brief detour. So there's this literature on adaptive data analysis that sort of studies something like the following problem. We've got some data set and we've got sort of an algorithm mediating access to it. And we've got a, an adaptive data analyst who's asking questions of the data set and then getting answers back. And maybe as a function of those answers, ask questions and gets more answers back and, and continues in this way. And, um, say the questions have the form, what is the expected value of some predicates on the distribution? Um, we'll call those QI. QIs will be the predicates. Uh, AIs will be the numeric valued answers. We can say that the mechanism has, has good sample accuracy if the empirical error in the worst case overall of the queries, by which I mean the difference between the answer we're given and the empirical average of the predicates evaluated on the points in the data set is small. And we can say that it's got good distributional accuracy if the error is small now, not evaluated on the data set we have, but in expectation over the distribution. And the, the sort of theorem that comes out of this literature informally says that if the answer is given by the algorithm are sample accurate and the algorithm is differentially private, uh, then for any adaptive data analyst, the answers are distributionally accurate. And just thinking a little bit about what's going on here, you know, if the, if the questions were non-adaptive, then um, you could answer very many of them uh, with distributional accuracy uh, just by just by answering um, just by answering, you know, with the empirical average, the empirical value of these queries. And the reason is sort of that if if there was if, if there was no dependence between the queries and the data set, you could imagine that the data set was sampled after the queries were fixed. 
and you'd have like a turnoff bound that tells you that with high probability you you get the right you know the empirical answer is close to the distributional answer for any particular query and you could union bound over all of the queries and the problem in general the reason why this isn't true for adaptive queries is because you can't imagine that the data set is sampled after the queries are fixed if you wanted to like imagine resampling the data set you'd have to imagine resampling the data set from the conditional distribution on data sets conditional on the sequence of queries so, and that's kind of hard to do and sometimes gives you very different distributions on data sets and what differential privacy sort of does here is it breaks the you know it mitigates the correlation between the queries on the data set so that when you go about resampling the data set from this conditional distribution, it's actually you know, not so different from resampling it from the original distribution. I mean, that's some like high level intuition. Okay. And the technical connection we're gonna use is the connection between differential privacy and, and max information, which is some worst case notion of mutual information. And we say that two random variables, X and Y have, um, max information, let's say K, if in the worst case over events defined over you know, this, this joint space X cross Y, the probability of that event under the joint distribution on X and Y, it's in the numerator here, is not so different than the probability of that event under the sort of product distribution where we sample X and Y independently of one another. In, it's in the denominator here. Um, and one, it's so, so it's sort of saying, you, know, you can talk about the, the, the beta approximate max information as well that, that uh, talks about events that have probability at least beta, but, but sort of maybe don't worry about the details. Um, oops, one second while I close a call. Um, Oh, so, so that's max information between two random variables. Um, if it's small, like what, what it's sort of saying at a high level is that the joint distribution between X and Y isn't that far from a product distribution. Their, their dependencies are, are mild. And we can say that an algorithm has uh, a you know, bounded approximate max information if for every distribution on data points, if we select a data set, um, consisting of n of those points sampled iid from the distribution, then the max information between the input data set and the output of the algorithm is small. And the technical connection we're gonna use is that if an algorithm is epsilon delta differentially private, then it has bounded max information. Okay. So let me tell you about, um, a very useful framework that is not ours. This is by Bertulli et al. and appeared in the uh, S&P conference this year. Um, and they're focusing on the non-convex setting. And, and I wanna focus on the non-convex setting as well, which is what's gonna lead to the interest in this framework, which is very general. Again, it's gonna look like subsample and aggregate. So at training time, you partition the data, you learn a model of each partition and you aggregate in some arbitrary way. And then at deletion time, you retrain the model corresponding to those parts of the partition that contain the deleted data point. Okay, and you aggregate in some arbitrary way. So the nice thing about this framework is um, the training can be arbitrary. So, and the aggregation can be arbitrary. We're not averaging model parameters necessarily. We could have the models vote. And so this is sort of a generic data deletion framework that sort of saves a fact, if we, if we partition the data into K parts, like saves a factor of K in retraining, <clears throat> no matter what your models are. Um, but the problem is that, oh, and, and they call it CISA. Um, the problem is it only has unlearning guarantees for um, non-adaptive deletion sequences, and those guarantees break for adaptive deletion sequences. And the thing that we notice is that you know, if you take algorithms in the same framework, but make sure that the aggregating functions are differentially private in the individual models, right? So you could use various existing techniques for privately aggregating the predictions of these models. Then together with 
there on learning guarantees against non-adaptive sequences and the ability for differential privacy to break correlations between inputs and outputs to the algorithm, you get um, you know, a similarly flexible model that has unlearning guarantees against adaptive deletion sequences. And there's a, a similar kind of approach in a very nice recent paper of, of Bamel et al doing this for streaming algorithms. Okay, so a picture, I'm running out of time. So let me go through this quickly because this is sort of similar to pictures you've seen before. But you know what the CISA method does is it splits the data point into k parts again for so they partition the data set for us for technical reasons it's actually going to be more convenient to think about sampling um, points independently to appear in each of these k parts with probability like one over k so it won't really be a partition points will appear possibly in more than one of the um, you know uh, splits but in expectation they only appear in one then you train on each of the parts of the partition and output models and aggregate however you like. Um, and when a deletion comes in, right, like the place the savings comes from is that you only need to retrain on the parts that contain the point that was to, uh, that was to be deleted, which is just, you know, one of them in expectation. So you save sort of a factor of K in computation. So what is true here? So first of all, this is really their theorem, but we sort of you know, formalize it in our setting with sequences of deletions. This really is a perfect unlearning algorithm um, if the sequence is chosen non-adaptively. But you can also prove that it does not have any non-trivial learning guarantee, unlearning guarantees at all. Uh, for adaptive deletion sequences. And you can sort of prove this theorem by coming up with, you know, adversarial deletion sequences. But um, if the aggregating functions are differentially private in the random coins that were used to split the data, uh, then it again recovers uh, unlearning guarantees. This follows from a max information bound. But if you want to sort of get intuition for the proof, sort of imagine that you know, always, well, you can always imagine resampling any random variable you come across, not from its original distribution, but from the sort of conditional distribution, given what you've, you know, in this case, revealed to the adversary. Okay, so, so like, think about the thought experiment where you resample the random coins that were used to partition the data from its conditional distribution, conditional on the view of the adversary. But because the view of the adversary was, um, differentially private. Max information bounds tell us that this conditional resampling distribution is close to its sort of unconditional distribution and resampling the points from its original distribution would have corresponded to retraining. Okay, so that's sort of the idea. And um, being differentially private in the models, if we use private vote aggregation, since the points uh, were selected IID, um, this is sort of where we're using the fact that we didn't really partition the points, but we sampled with replacement. This implies privacy of the random coins. Okay. And in the last two minutes, let me just briefly show you like, an, you know, we, so we have like a theorem saying that without privacy, CISA doesn't have any non-trivial unlearning guarantees. Let me walk you through briefly um, like an empirical demonstration of this fact on some real data sets. So I'm gonna show you a plot on the next slide. It corresponds to the following experiment. Um, we just sort of ran some version of CISA. We partitioned the data, we trained neural networks using stochastic gradient descent. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up with like an adversarial sequence of deletions. And what we're gonna do essentially is uh, run membership inference attacks on the on the models to try to guess which points were used to train which models. Okay, we'll do a very simple version of this. We're just going to guess that a point um, was used to train the model that has the highest confidence in that point label. Okay, and then our adversarial deletion sequence is just going to um, say we have k of these models. It's going to delete the points that appear that is going to delete the points that we guess were used to train the first k over two of the models. 
the first half of the model. Okay, so, so our goal is to make the first half of the models like look bad and make the second half of the models look good after this deletion sequence. So we want to do like a hypothesis test to like falsify the claim that this algorithm might have deletion guarantees. And our test statistic is just going to be the expectation you know, of the indicator of whether the average accuracy for the first half of the models is lower than the average accuracy for the second half of the models. Now, under retraining, there would be symmetry. Under retraining, the points would be freshly randomized across the models. And so there'd be, you know, and so the first half of the models would have higher accuracy with probability one half. So the expectation of this test statistic is, would be one half. But, um, you know, under this unlearning procedure, the extent to which the expectation of this indicator, you know, can be confidently shown to be bounded away from one half, you know, that falsifies unlearning guarantees. And the further you can bound it away from one half, the um, so sort of the, the larger values of alpha you sort of certify unlearning guarantees with respect to. Okay. And then <coughs> we're also going to try repeating this experiment by training with a little bit of noise. Um, not enough to cause our theorems to be non-trivial, but we'll sort of see that a little bit of noise sort of at least breaks this attack. Okay, and so what we're seeing on two plots, which just correspond to running this experiment on two data sets, MNIST and CIFAR-10, let's just focus attention on the left one, is the following. The um, X, the, the, the Y axis, corresponds to the accuracy of the model that we've trained. The y-axis corresponds to the expectation, our estimate for the expectation of our test statistic, okay, with confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals. And the vertical line on the left corresponds to 0.5, right, right, the, the value of the expectation under this test statistic under the null hypothesis that CISA has deletion guarantees. And what we see, oh, and, and then the points are labeled by numbers, which correspond to sort of some magnitude of noise that was added to gradients to training. So at the top right corner, you see 0.0. .0. That's sort of the result that we get when we don't add any noise at all. So this is just running CISA as it was originally described. And we see that on MNIST, we get like a pretty accurate model, like, you know, hair under 98%. But our test statistic is, you know, quite confidently bounded, you know, quite confidently not 0.5. Okay, which is which is a proof, you know, statistical proof that um, that this algorithm like did not in fact have deletion guarantees against this adaptively chosen sequence. And then what we see is by by sort of dialing up a little bit the noise that we add to the gradients during training. Again, this these are not give. This is not enough noise to give like non-trivial like privacy analyses, but we're just adding a little bit of noise. Um, you know, we, we can we can get pretty close to this 0.5, you know, at least where our confidence intervals are um, intersecting. So we're no longer, you know, falsifying the deletion guarantees of CISA using this particular attack while bringing the accuracy down from say 97% to 91%. So there's a, you know, there's a non-trivial cost, but it's not catastrophic. Okay, so this is, you know, maybe suggestive that um, that noise is useful, is a useful protection, even even if it's not at a level that that provides theoretical guarantees. Okay, so I'm out of time, but thank you for listening. Um, if you're interested, these are the two papers that I talked about. Other questions from? Let's see so if I can bring up. I guess uh, I have a question, Aaron. Okay. Yes. Which is about for for the model you're considering, what's what's the right kind of accuracy statement um, to prove? So, like, there's a sense in which the unlearning guarantee implies um, that the you know 
model from which you're deleting is as accurate as the the the, the model with after post deletion is as accurate as what you would have gotten from training from scratch just because they're indistinguishable right mm -hmm. and so is it the case that one should just focus on those two objectives separately or they or do they kind of in do they uh, like yeah, so, uh, so you're asking like why do we need accuracy guarantees separately at all. You're asking, like, why do we need accuracy guarantees separately from unlearning guarantees? So, uh, yeah, well, may, maybe. I guess I'm just asking, like, is is it sufficient to just look at accuracy on the on an original data set without deletion? That seems to be the case. But is it ever worth kind of asking how much the deletion process m m messes with accuracy? Yeah. So let me let's see. Mm. So, so I guess the question is, what does full retraining mean? Right. So, so in the process of defining your deletion scheme, you define the initial training algorithm and the update algorithm. Right. Now, um, full retraining means rerunning the initial training algorithm. So it is possible to have perfect deletion guarantees without any accuracy guarantees at all if our initial training algorithm just outputs like a constant function, for example. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is why it's sort of important to think about the unlearning guarantees sort of separately from the accuracy guarantees. You wanna be able to be indistinguishable from retraining, but like also for a good retraining algorithm. Right, but I guess what I was asking is like, it seems you could then conclude that because the deleted model is similar to the original, that they have, you know, roughly similar accuracy guarantees, right? That that's that's true. Would make sense. Yeah. Right? If they don't, they're not similar. But uh, I was just wondering if there's sort of any value to separately thinking about like, is there any sense in which? Uh, you know, is there anything weird that happens? I guess was my question. I wasn't like a yeah. It's so, a good question. Let's see. So I let's see. So I haven't thought about it um, directly in the way you're posing it. Now, so I suppose you're right that you know you, there's no reason, at least if you don't mind losing in your accuracy term, you know, like some factors of alpha and beta. There's no reason why you wouldn't just analyze the accuracy of the original training procedure and the sort of unlearning guarantees, again, up to these factors of alpha and beta. Um, but you know, in some sense, like, like because of that, but like you're not really analyzing something that different, but like the accuracy of the, of the original training procedure will always be closely related to the accuracy of like what you get from the update algorithm because of the unlearning guarantees, but like, that quantity still trades off with the unlearning guarantees in, in the same way. So, so, so I don't know if I'm. Yeah, no, I think your your answer makes sense. Um, I was just wondering, like, you know, often these um, the accuracy guarantees are, you know, of the form. Well, you're within like your error scales like one over square root of n, and the unlearning guarantees are like, well, we'll set alpha to a constant. And so suddenly those start to look like very different. The final, you know, the accuracy of the of the deleted model starts to look very different from the original. That's right. right. Potentially, yeah, that's right. So, so getting the accuracy of the of the update algorithm via the unlearning guarantees might not be the best way to do it. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking out loud about that. Yeah. No, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean. I think problems could use more thinking out loud. So I guess I had a, another meta question, which is like, to what extent, you know, you, these the analysis is the analyses you presented are are very kind of bespoke to the particular uh, type of model you're considering. Mm -hmm. And I wonder to what extent one can make these kind of transformations generic. Like this, the second one you presented seems a lot, you know, more more general generic mm -hmm. you know do you 
do you have any like thoughts on sort of like what, what you know what family of models this problem is sort of solved for and for which families of, of initial training algorithms so we've got more work to do yeah so, so like the second one is sort of generic to what like the second one sort of covers everything that appears in this very sparse machine and learning literature. So, so I think the interesting questions there are what else can you do for non convex models. So, so for like for non convex models, you, you know, if you want something with rigorous guarantees that isn't making assumptions about the data, then the CISA thing is, you know, basically it. Like you split the data, you train however you want, and, and then you aggregate. There's some other work that sort of, you know, if you have public data for pre-training, then you know, okay, like you pre-train the non-convex part of it, and then you can do fine-tuning, and you know, you're really just doing data deletion on the convex model, which is the final layer. Um, so, so we, you know, so, so our reduction is sort of generic to anything in the CISA family in thinking about how you could make things like that more generic i think that the first question that would come up is just for you know for model agnostic methods that sort of do not assume that you know you're training a convex model or some particular thing like what can you do at all beyond beyond just this sort of sample splitting i think the literature just doesn't have answers to that yet in part because you know, there's not very many ideas in this literature yet. But I think that's like, like before generalizing this kind of result, I would ask, you know, what are just other techniques for even for non adaptive deletion sequences. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Uh, all right, so we should, we should thank Aaron again. Thank you for having me. And uh, Aaron, we, we can't, you know, we can't shove a sandwich through the Zoom connection. But, uh, we're happy to treat you to lunch next time you're in Boston, at least. Uh, Sounds good. Yeah. I will let you know next time I'm in Boston. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you. Take care.